A lot of times when fashion brands don't grow, it's because they're unwilling to let go, unwilling to actually bring on professional management of people to support the growth. And I've seen a lot of brands, the founders are great. Their creativity is, is just off the roof. But when it comes to going down to execution and to scaling up, I've seen a lot of people fail because they're just not willing to let go. You can't do everything. You have to know what you can do, what you can't do. Welcome to Super Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Shahid Durrani. Today we have with us Joanne Chow. Joanne is a world-recognized Forbes Asia Power Businesswoman of 2019. In 2012, Chow started In The House, an innovation and R&D consulting firm that serves leading brands, including Adidas Andrew and Ted Baker. Welcome to our show, Joanne. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So I, I like the way that you spell in the house. So it's I-N-D <laughs> for David house. Yeah, there's a Is story there... to it. Yeah, yeah I um, want to hear that. <laughs> so when we were first looking to build an R&D lab, we weren't too sure yeah. some fashion word, how relevant it is. But most fashion designers mm -hmm. usually have trouble trying to stay independent. So it's mm -hmm. called indie house. So you can be independent, but at the same time, mm -hmm. you can be part of an in-house team. Most brands usually independence consultancy, but also would like an in-house approach to it. And so that's why we played with the words. So it's independent design or in-house services. And that's how we started Makes with sense. our consulting sure. different brands. Hmm. So I always assumed that these big brands have their internal departments. What you provide is on top of that, or they don't have the internal, and they utilize companies like yourself? There are a few types of customers and brands that use lab hmm. like ourselves. Hmm. They may already have an idea of what they want to create, but they have trouble interpreting it. And so they mm -hmm. might need someone like ourselves to build you know, an R&D team to look at what can be developed. And then separately, there are brands who just have a full collection, but they need to work with outsourced partners. And because they can design the work, doesn't mean they can create the actual product or have the expertise to be global about their supply chain. So they may use design workshops like ourselves to help them. There are people like us in Europe, in US, in New York, Milan, and London. So in Asia, Windy House is known for knit specialty. So it helps people go from you know, imagining a knit sweater to knit, knitting an upper to knitting technical products. So Indie House has always been around the last 10 years to help push the boundaries of niche, and that's its specialty. So technical products, meaning, can you elaborate? We do some technical products with tech companies in terms okay. of, yeah. So they may have you know, soft goods that may require knitted expertise. So they do engage someone like Indie House to provide that type of expertise for them, where they may previously make hard goods or softwares, but to have a consumer experience, they would use labs to help uh, find the right material and to interpret. Mm. So Joanne, how do you spark innovations with these big brands? What is your process? I guess my first few years was learning from other buyers and designers in terms mm -hmm. of what inspired them, what did they look at on the high street, what did they review in terms of developments. So a lot of times I went around from the raw material shows to the big trade fairs to determine what's appropriate. And from there, it broken down to what we see trending in the next few years. And if so, what we can develop from there. The recognition that you received in, in 2009 is very impressive, by the way. Congratulations. Can you share with us how that recognition has 
shaped your leadership style, especially when you're working with innovation? That was a kind of a turning point in terms of my career, being able, being recognized by external parties and not just my own team or clients was a huge recognition. Probably not quite yet fostering an innovation, but for sure, my understanding of myself better. It, it was a very humbling experience where I knew friends were nominating me for the awards, but I didn't know that I would possibly win. And so when the awards came out, I was pleasantly surprised and I received a lot of congratulatory notes. But me being Chinese, I was very humble about it. So I wasn't like throwing a celebration or going around parading it. I was just quite doing my own thing and day to day. I think one of the things I did learn from it was your parents' reaction to you and your reaction to your parents' expectations. And in this case, I wouldn't say my parents are tough. I would say that they're not one to show uh, success and one to recognize it. And because I was disappointed that they didn't recognize me, that it was one of those turning points where I realized I was doing it for them. And in fact, I wanted to do it for myself. So that's why my leadership style really changed thereafter, where it was not as outwards towards you know, pleasing my parents or you know, doing it for others. It was more like mm. when I think it's doing the right thing, I proceed. And I think it was more like building conviction in myself and, and my belief and, and continue to evolve, especially over COVID. So post that award, I was still building out my business into different markets. But without that faith and conviction, I don't think I could have pulled through and built mm. new business during most difficult times globally. So that's why mm. I'm very fortunate to have won that award and very fortunate to be recognized. And since then, it's just helped me just grow stronger year on year be yeah. because of it. So maybe not yeah, on the good. innovation part, but more in the conviction and belief in myself. Inner stuff. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. And the key word there is faith. That faith is what gets people to go when things are challenging. Correct. Yeah. Can you share a challenging experience while working with some of these fashion giants that allowed you to express your leadership skills? For most part, I am actually more behind the scene than outwardly mm. negotiating with brands because most of the times when you do these type of consultancy roles, you actually have to understand what the problems are, what the programs are, and in a contract negotiation part, ensure all parties are able to deliver. So I think one of my achievements would be to protect brand value to ensure that the IP and integrity uh, remain strong despite people wanting to cost cut and, and streamline on different programs. So understanding what the value is, the structure is, and how you can actually pioneer and push boundaries is what made some of the programs uh, very important to brands we developed for. We continue to be engaged in different projects. The team continue to support many different brands. So we're at the forefront of change and I'm really proud of where we've gone with innovation in clothing and of course in hey, the apparel. There are, there are a lot of changes, especially with e-commerce and technology overall. How do you stay ahead in having so much competition in this industry? How do you stay ahead? Can you share some strategies on that part? Sure. Thank you for that question. I think, uh, during COVID, I built out a system called Jelly Beans. Um, it's pretty mm -hmm. much a program similar to what finance people use with Bloomberg. You can look at the portfolio. You can look at how your brand's doing. Um, so that helps me navigate uh, through COVID. So I'm able to know whether brands invested in themselves, whether they continue to evolve their program, and is it, of course, capturing to the end audience they want to engage with. So a lot of times when we do qualitative research, we have to go to London, Milan, Florence, UK, as well as US. But because COVID, we couldn't travel as easily, but I still wanted to know who's doing well and doing what. I built out a system with my uh, co-founder 
who comes from finance. So using fintech to use it for fashion in order to capture data. That's definitely something new that we, we uh, pioneered and we challenge ourselves, but now it can be used in terms of trend forecasting tool, reporting tool, as well as uh, AI generative fashion and benchmarking uh, fashion collections. While at first I was just gathering intelligence, I think now it's really evolved with a change uh, in technology. Whereas 10 years ago, I was just looking at design, I was looking at what's happening across different labs around the world. I'm able to learn more about the ecosystem of fashion and who's doing what and where and why we see successes in certain places and why we've seen failures in certain types of inventory and products launched in the market. Yeah, it's been a very interesting three years mm. because of COVID, but because of that, I built new business and new insights that we wouldn't have had access to if we weren't all stuck at home shopping online. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Lessons learned. How about sustainability? Are you in that realm when it comes to innovation? Yes and no. I think um, sustainability is a very important topic at the moment. I started looking at this topic maybe before I founded Indie House around 15, 20 years ago when I first graduated from college looking at the organics program globally. But since then, the organic program didn't quite fly off, take off. So what I see is that sustainability now is about how to ensure that you don't oversupply in the market and you can purchase more responsibility and brands can actually look through the entire vertical so that they know where they're sourcing from, who's developed it and why. And that's really changed um, from when I first started in the industry um, in a way. Yes, I've definitely done a lot more in the sustainable market, uh, but I want to do even more because um, it's just at the beginning uh, of the change. Uh, but this is the first time I actually do think this is staying, this trend is staying for good. And it's not just a fad, but but for, for sure, we're looking at it because everyone cares about the environment. Everyone mm. has experienced global warming and that's mm. also changing yeah. how we consume. Yeah, and, and what's happening in nature is, is quite clear. The amount of natural disasters have inclined at, a, at an extremely high level. It's wonderful that we have an opportunity to make some corrections, and especially with people like you out there doing so. The Gen Z especially, I don't think they would even purchase anything if it's not sustainable. I'm not sure if there's any stats on that, but... They're quite uh, serious about this. Gen Z and Gen Alpha in the future, for sure. Mm. I jokingly mm. say when we were growing up, people would go to bars, but now Gen Z and Gen Alpha are probably in the meditation room. And it's not a joke. It's about how much they care. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> it's, it, it's we, true. we do think uh, it's a different audience. They're less brand oriented yeah. in terms of those that are just consumer driven, but much more caring about what they represent. So you definitely seen that change. So in your entrepreneurial journey, you must have faced some challenges and received some incredible lessons. Could you share a specific experience or a lesson that you learned that could help someone in the audience? It's actually very hard for entrepreneur to really pivot. I think a lot of times we believe in ourselves and that's why we're entrepreneurs to begin with. But however, we have to understand market dynamic changes, financials are difficult to come by. So making changes to your original business plan is not something wrong, it's actually something you should constantly do. So one thing I've definitely learned across my 10 years of from Indie House to founding a mad design to now going to jelly beans is it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in one month. It doesn't happen in one year. Sometimes change happens in three years, five years, and 10 years. And mm. to prepare mm. for that, you actually have to slowly think through what's needed. So for Indie House, for example, as I was sharing earlier, we went from fashion apparel knit to athletic knit. That took, program took three years to develop. And from athletic knit to technical knit took another three to four years. So across 10 years, we managed to grow in three different categories and, and be pioneer in these categories. But 
it took 10 years from the idea of you know, visiting factories in, in Milan, Venice, to others, to actually growing a lab that caters to various factories that can use our service. And then separately for retail, as some of brand build takes a long time. And, and for the audience to understand what you represent, I think most of the times it took me three to five years to build up a brand from scratch in the market. So Jelly Beans, the program for data, I've scraped. Took me one year to gather information, another year to machine learn. And then the third year is just implementing how AI would use the information to grow different algorithms, using insights to personalize it and also work with something that we can apply in the fashion industry. As an entrepreneur, it doesn't happen overnight, but you have to be ready to change and ask and seek help. And I'm really grateful for a lot of my friends who've continued to support me along the journey. Mm. So would you say patience is a key factor? Patience and willingness to listen. Maybe mm. you Openness. don't have to listen to everyone. You just have to know what, where they're coming from and be able to analyze. Mm. They come from a good mm. place. But do you take their advice? What are you going to change about it? What are their concerns? For example, one comment we had with AI was, oh, it's plagiarism. So I said, no, if that's the case and that's how you think of AI, I change it all to benchmarking. So that way it's like grammar. It's grammatically incorrect. By doing AI benchmarking, I'm able to know this particular garment is closest to XYZ. And if so, you are aware of what's in the market so you don't create something that's exactly the same. So if you're able to use AI differently and also grow from it, your whole entire vertical and supply chain and management process can really change because you have an assistant that's there to support you. So mm -hmm. that's one. Yes. I guess it, I'm not telling people not just to be patient, I'm telling people to be open-minded mm -hmm. and, and be open minded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Open-minded is definitely very important. Sometimes our ego may get in the way to not have that open mind, but it's so important, especially nowadays with so much advancements that are happening all around us. Is there any advice you can give an entrepreneur that may be looking to uh, launch a fashion brand that they could focus on initially where their energy should be? mostly invested in obviously they have to wear different hats but is there something that you could share that could help or guide them in that journey especially in the beginning so recently to do more different projects i've stepped down on one of the business i founded and hired someone to replace me as not just a founder but ceo and what i've learned from that is we've got to learn be able to be good teachers. You actually have to be able to share with others what made you successful so you can help evolve. And at the entrepreneur, very early days, you don't know what it is. You're constantly learning and growing like a sponge. But mm -hmm. when it comes to fashion brands, there's so many tools out there today that you don't have to do it all yourself. So I would suggest people to like Gen Z, Use YouTube, use, use different things to learn about what skill sets you may be missing in order to be better. And being better really is really important to continue to push yourself, learn and grow. Because if not, um, you may you know be out of touch. You may be creating something just for mm -hmm. sake of creating, but you're not one financially growing because you actually, in fashion, you have to have doors. How many wholesale accounts are you opening? How many doors are you opening? Because without it, you can't scale. And without scaling, you actually can't manage to buy, which is inventory. So a lot of times when fashion brands don't grow, it's because they're unwilling to let go, unwilling to actually bring on professional management of people to support the growth. And I've seen a lot of brands, the founders are great. Their creativity is, is just off the roof. But when it comes to going down to execution and to scaling up, I've seen a lot of people fail because they're just not willing to let go. You can't do everything. You have to know what you can do, what you can't do. And from there, know enough to be able to manage the business and manage everyone's expectations of you. If not, you're stuck with a lot of products with no 
avenue to, to sell to, or you have great design, but you're not recognized. So I feel mm -hmm. like you're starting a fashion brand today. You need to know a lot of the tools out there that's relevant on an influencer, KOL, KLC base. But at the same time, not just social media and marketing, you have to understand what your money is buying. Are you buying marketing? Or are you buying inventory? Are you buying products, if so, or services? And how is that going to help you on the top line and the bottom line? Because at the end of the day, we want season to improve on and not you know, go bankrupt. And, and from there, build a better business. So I guess the long-winded answer is you have to really evolve. <laughs> Thank you so much for that answer, Joanne. It was wonderful. Can you share what you feel your innermost superpower is that got you to this point in life? I think I mentioned earlier, having faith and conviction is really important. Mm -hmm. And I continue mm -hmm. to believe that. And it's not just about religious or you know faith. It's more mm -hmm. you have faith in yourself. Capabilities. And mm -hmm. Capabilities. And areas mm -hmm. that you know you're bad at train for it. I mm -hmm. think my husband's a marathon runner and every time I see him change things, whether it's change his shoes or train, change his training methodology and work with different people, I just see how he pushes himself. And the same thing I would tell entrepreneurs, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. So if you mm -hmm. evolve, you have to know what you need to do, what you need to change to actually grow to be a stronger entrepreneur. And there is no roadmap about, you, you can learn a lot from biographies, but it's your own path. So would you agree the mindset and inner work is, is a good starting point to create a foundation? Growth mindset, for sure. I jokingly mm. walk into office every day. I said, if I'm not positive about my day, who's going to work with or for me? Mm. If, mm. if I come in depressed or come in angry, and, and unreasonable, yeah. why am I bringing my frustration to your workplace? So mm. I feel as entrepreneurs, we have to be responsible of who we work with, the team we build up, and also mm. uh, believe that we're going to go to great places and new heights. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's all energy at the end of the day. And to have that energy coming in, beginning your day, it has an effect on everyone around you. So that was a very good point. Thank you, mm -hmm. Joanne. Appreciate your time today. It was wonderful speaking to you. Wishing you all the best.